now it is the forensic case that gripped the nation's attention. Though we now know what caused the death of Dandora activist Caroline Mwada, questions still abound on how bodies of the dead are generally handled from identification to presentation to the mortuary and how various relevant agencies work together in the investigation and processing of the information of the deceased. Well, joining me in studio now is Dr. Amrit Pal Kaur Mirna Kalsi. She is a forensic specialist as well as the deputy head of Division of Pathology and Forensics in the Ministry of Health. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Dr. Mirna. Thank you, thank uh, a lot of questions, of course, after this case came into play uh, earlier this week and we found out what happened to uh, Caroline Mwada. Unfortunately, uh, we found out it was due to an abortion. But when it comes to the general top, uh, rather topic of managing dead bodies, mm -hmm. for instance, if you find yourself in the unlikely event of someone dying in your home or knocking someone on the road, for instance, what should one do? when you are in the presence of a cadaver, for instance? Well, uh, Victoria, thank you for this opportunity. I would say to answer your question, the first thing the person should do is actually call the police. Mm. Um, because uh, we, you, you know, you, it, it is the police who would then assist to ensure that a body is then uh, correctly handled because you need to know whether that is actually a sudden suspicious death or uh, the circumstances around the death are very clear and then do, and may not warrant an investigation. Right. For example, a natural death or someone who has been ill, chronically ill for a while. Uh, however, a, an investigation process is uh, it's very important to have someone present who understands whether uh, a body should actually undergo uh, further investigation uh, any investigation process so the police will be tasked with actually transporting the body to the mortuary for instance um, in an ideal um, practice on forensic management of the dead it is usually the police responsibility or what we call a coroner's responsibility mm -hmm. to transport or to facilitate the movement of the dead. Right. Yeah. Now, when it comes to presenting the body at the mortuary, for instance, well, the one who is bringing it must identify themselves. Yes. Because that, of course, helps with investigations. Mm -hmm. How is this done, practically speaking? Well, um, I'll speak about the ideal standard. Yeah. Um, ideally, when somebody is bringing a, a, a body to a mortuary facility, um, the, it is actually what is happening is a transfer of custody yeah. from one party to another that this is a deceased person. So in an ideal setting where you have a coroner, for example, you would actually have the coroner then transferring that body and then the, the mortuary that is admitting it, w the admission, uh, the person in charge of admissions would then admit the body and they would agree that, you know, I'm bringing a, uh, presenting to you a, f in a an, an, an adult female, mm. uh, you know, the families, this family or the body is unknown and and uh, and then the admitting person in the mortuary would also agree that yes we have received the body of an adult a female uh, belonging to this family allegedly belonging to this family right. um, you know and brought here with this person and these are their this is their identity this is their name and this is their contact number so that's ideally how it should work. And in the case of uh, an unidentified body, for instance, and of course we saw that happen with Caroline Mwada, she was put under a different name, which caused some of the confusion when uh, the family was looking for the body. Uh, what happens in terms of trying to find the identity of this individual? Well, um, you know, people go missing every day yeah. globally. And um, either that person is missing somewhere alive or they are missing somewhere deceased. And uh, some people even facilitate their own disappearance, mm. you know, when you have identity theft and things like that. So, um, so sorry, just remind me. So basically trying to identify a body that right. don't have their uh, names. So, or yeah, names. so when you have these unidentified bodies um, you know, there is a procedure, ideally, according to the international standards on best practice on how to manage these bodies, is that um, if you're in the mortuary and you receive a body that is unknown because 
the person who's in the mortuary does not know who this person yeah. is. You know, you could be receiving anybody from anywhere um, in terms of any, like someone is picked by the road, you know, deceased person, and you don't know the identity of this person. There must be an investigative procedure to establish the identity of this deceased person. And some of those standards or guidelines that exist internationally are, for example, the, you know, what kind of body do you have? Mm -hmm. So you take preliminary notes, you know, we have uh, an adult, unknown, human, female, um, uh, you know, black hair, mm. Um, you know, you describe the, 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 some forms have the color of the, the skin, you know, uh, color of eyes, um, you know, wearing like, for example, wearing this a blue watch and, and, and this blouse and wearing a skirt or these are the shoes. So basically documenting all the, the, the biological data of this right. person that you can see visibly and then also the associated evidence like the clothing, the shoes and all the other effects and and which is why we always say whenever somebody has passed away we never remove personal mm. effects from them unless of course you have situations where it is actually an emergency to to do it so now yeah. when the body's in the custody of uh, mortuary, for instance, now autopsy procedure begins. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that entail and who can actually request for an autopsy? Because you've seen in many cases where several parties ask uh, mm -hmm. for an autopsy to be conducted. Who is authorized to make such a request? Um, in a, basically, as long as you have a sudden suspicious death, for example, in Kenya, and uh, uh, these suspicious deaths all over the world, they warrant an investigation. Yeah. So it is the police who request the forensic pathology service or the forensic medical service, in essence, to, to establish the cause, the manner and mechanism of death of that person. And when it comes to storage as well, because many times you're also dealing with an active police case and in investigations, for instance, uh, more needs to be done in terms of getting more evidence from the body. How should it be stored in a proper way that they're able to retrieve some of this? Well, uh, I think that the thing is that um, um, evidence, it is crucial that evidence is collected as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Evidence can get damaged, it can get destroyed, it can get contaminated. So um, as soon as is feasibly possible, then you would do the post-mortem. Now we also need to understand that um, um, they, sometimes you, you don't have as many s specialists in a certain field um, to with all the kind of probably the work that is, that is there because you know issues like to do with births and yeah. weddings and deaths, you will always have a larger figure than you have people to handle them necessarily so so I think this is probably is just not just a Kenyan challenge mm -hmm. but a rather a, a regional challenge a global challenge you know and with catastrophe or pandemics it's worse absolutely yeah of course you have to deal with control uh, so it doesn't spread to the other population as well you're right uh, but let's talk about uh, just improving the general forensic services in this country what you just described is the ideal right which, which isn't always the case here in mm. Kenya mm. Um, but what needs to be done to at least deal with some of the gaps because of course that later on impacts on whether someone gets justice in a courtroom or whether a family member gets uh, closure to find out what was the cause of death of their loved one mm. but when we're looking at just the general structures here in Kenya what needs to be improved when it comes to forensic services um, one I would say at least for missing persons um, I, I mean there are databases that exist worldwide and you know Kenya is like the home of Sil it's like the Silicon Valley of Africa mm. so um, to have a somewhat of a, a digital platform where you have anti-mortem information. So when a person goes missing, um, to add to the recording that the person has gone missing, you also are able to say, okay, the person goes missing on this date, right. they were last seen wearing this, they were in this neighborhood, and uh, you know, information is collected about this person. Um, and you can collect various kinds of information, dental information, you know, if this person was in the military, you would collect all the military information on this person. Maybe they, were, they, were, they had a surgery, maybe they had an amputated leg. So you collect that information on one side and that's called anti-mortem information. And then you create a, a, a platform 
similar to that, but a post-mortem one. Mm. So you say, you know, the, a body arrived of an unknown adult male, you know, uh, the body was fingerprinted, the body uh, went through a, a radiology, uh, post-mortem was conducted, this was, the, the body was found in this area, you know, autopsy procedure was conducted, and, you know, this is the cause and the, the manner and mechanism of the death of this person. Right. And so this information would be sitting generally in these two platforms where you could reconcile data and see whether you have cases of missing persons that should actually uh, that are actually cases that were in the morgue mm -hmm. or are you know are still in the morgue and um, and you could have cases of, of your know, unknown or unclaimed bodies in the mortuary for mortuaries for years and and so this issue is like I said the issue of the dead managing the dead is really uh, is such a global issue and yeah. the challenges still remain the same uh, wherever you go um, so, so, so this is one issue that can be sorted out. This can help to filter out and reunite uh, human remains, dead bodies to their families and loved ones. Right. Because someone could have just left home and then um, ended up deceased and in a mortuary in, for example, Mombasa. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, you don't really know <laughs> that this person maybe got on a train or a plane or, you know, and a family may not necessarily be aware. Um, the second thing I think that could definitely assist is legislation, yeah. uh, improved legislation. We have legislation now, the National Coroner Service Act, that is yet to be implemented. And, and we look forward to the implementation of that act. Um, uh, um, however, I think we, we definitely can, can add better, we can, we can improve services and we can improve the legislation on this issue of dead, the missing and burial practices in our country. And there's also an issue of how fragmented the various relevant agencies that deal with forensic services are in different ministries, so it's very hard to kind of synergize mm. what they do. Right. How can they improve that? And of course you just mentioned the act that's already in play. Mm. Um, well. I think there has to be a concerted um, effort, which I, I think is currently th there. Are, there is some attempts to to ensure this, but I think being in uh, different kind of structures um, with different stakeholders doing somewhat some forensic work here or there or in different segments and programs, yeah. the the fragmentation is something that. Um, that there needs to be more, I would say, to, to improve cohesion in, in the provision of police forensic services, medical forensic services, and lab and science forensic services, because the cohesion of these services enables, like, for example, the pr prosecutor's office to, because they're a beneficiary mm -hmm. of making sure that that chain actually is, 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 is uh, not broken at any point in time. Right. Uh, before we wrap up, there's a question here from Dr. Mukyoka from on Twitter saying, "Can a coroner, using expert knowledge, distinguish between a normal post-abortion death and a disembowelment?" Um, sorry, could you read the question? To yeah. Me again? Can you dis distinguish between a normal post-abortion death and a disembowelment? Um, uh, okay. According to the National Coroner Service Act, the way it is now. Um, it doesn't uh, stipulate in detail yeah. who exactly a coroner is. And mm. in, uh, in, in, in many countries, you would find a coroner does not necessarily have to be a forensic, what we would call a forensic medical examiner. Uh, but so I would say given if you, you are dealing with a forensic pathologist, then they would be able to make that differentiation. But you're, if you're dealing with a person who is non-technical in forensic pathology, then that would become a challenge. A challenge. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I, and I, 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 I hear him. Mm. I, I understand him. And I, and I think um, things need to be better defined. And this is what I was saying that uh, I think uh, adding on the legislation more comprehensively would assist the system. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And of course, trying to shed light on an area many times is seen as a low priority uh, when it comes here uh, to Kenya. Thank you so much, Dr. Marina, for your time. And let's take a short break here on Citizen Weekend. We have much more ahead, including sports news. Stay with us. <laughs>